Lab equipment is expensive, often way too expensive. What if I told you that one of the most powerful particle size analysis tools can be 3D printed for a fraction of its market cost? Today I'm showcasing my Airjet Sieve design, an affordable and accessible way to classify and analyze fine powders in the lab. Whether you've never heard of particle size analysis or you're actively searching for a solution, this video is a great example of looking at an old product through the lens of a new manufacturing technique. So what is particle size analysis? Whenever a material is ground into a powder, it doesn't break down into uniform particles. Instead, grinding produces a range of particle sizes, from larger fragments to fine dust. Particle size analysis is the process of measuring the size distribution in the lab to ensure that the final product meets specific requirements. A powder's particle size and variation significantly impacts the material's overall performance. It ensures that every cup of instant coffee you've ever had tasted the way it did, and that every bag of cement will provide the same performance. There are two main approaches to particle size analysis, sieve-based methods and laser diffraction analysis. Laser diffraction instruments are highly accurate and can measure a wide range of particle sizes, but they're extremely expensive compared to sieve-based methods, ranging from $30,000 to $100,000. Sieve-based methods provide a more affordable and widely used alternative. Within sieve-based methods, there are two primary options, vibratory sieving and air jet sieving. Vibratory sieves rely on mechanical shaking to pass particles through a stack of progressively finer mesh sieves, making them well suited for coarser materials typically above 50 microns. Or for powders that include ultra-fine particles, they tend to clog the mesh, reducing efficiency and resulting in inaccurate results. Air jet sieves, on the other hand, use a high-velocity airstream to fluidize and separate particles, making them ideal for very fine powders, even down to a few microns, while preventing clogging. Traditional air jet sieves start at around $10,000, but with my 3D printed design, this technology becomes significantly more accessible for researchers and even small scale manufacturers. Next, let's look at a cross section of an air jet sieve to understand how they work. On one side, you have a vacuum suction port, which hooks up to a vacuum cleaner to provide the driving force that pulls particles smaller than the sieve mesh through it. On the other side, you have the air inlet, where all the air being drawn by the vacuum enters the system. Uh, right above the air inlet, you have the rotating wand. The rotating wand works by forcing all the air coming through the inlet into a thin slit, creating an air blade. This air blade is positioned right below the sieve, and as it rotates, it clears up any particles clogging the sieve. It launches the particles at the lid, which breaks down any agglomeration. This gives particles smaller than the mesh multiple opportunities to pass through. Let's get into the build. These are the components and tools I used to make the air jet sieve. This is the main body of the device, I'll get into its features in a second. Most functional components were 3D printed on a hobby level bamboo A1 printer. At the heart of the unit is a micro N50 motor with a gearbox outputting between 50 to 200 RPM. The centering bearing keeps the wand in place. Taking a closer look at the main body of the unit, you'll notice it has many features on the bottom side. It was designed to be printed without any support material. This section keeps the motor in place with a channel leading to an electrical port. These four threaded holes accommodate M8 bolts that keep the base on securing the motor and its wiring. These three ports are all air inlet ports. Instead of making one large inlet port, I divided the area into three to reduce the unit's height and required material. On the outside here is a vacuum port with some bypass holes, I'll talk about that in a bit. I begin the assembly by popping the bearing into place. Next I attach the DC power socket with its pre-soldered wires into place. The soldering iron was then preheated and the motor's terminals were soldered onto the connector's wires. Polarity doesn't matter here, the motor can spin in either direction. After the motor was soldered, the wand is fitted in place from the top, but before I do that, I start threading the set screw that secures the wand to the motor shaft. I tighten the set screw from the bottom, and now I can move on to the base assembly. For the base, I have two components. On the left is an optional laser cut 5mm sheet of metal. Its purpose is to add weight to the final assembly, keeping it secure on the table with everything moving inside. 
On the right side is a printed component that can be used as a standalone base and has additional mounting points to secure the unit to a piece of wood or a table if you don't have access to the laser cut component. These attachments go on the vacuum port. The yellow one is to manually control the vacuum bypass holes and the black component is a quick release fitting for the vacuum of my choice. Add some silicon grease to the thread to make it easier to thread the components. A useful hack for any 3D printed thread. Any vacuum adapter can be made to thread on similarly to use a different vacuum cleaner model. For simple motor speed control, I chose to use a variable 12 volt DC power supply can be used to visually change the rotational speed of the wand. Taking a closer look at the wand, you'll see the thin slit at the top. You'll also see four small holes right above the bearing. Similar to the slit, some of the air being drawn by the vacuum is diverted into these holes, and as the wand rotates, they blow out the powder sitting on the bearing to keep it clean. Making the lid requires using a standard drill bit to make holes for the three M3 bolts. The 3D printed centering ring has holes under each of the three handles acting as drill guides. The lid just pops on and off of a standard 200mm diameter sieve. The sieve itself pops into place onto the main body. For my vacuum of choice, I decided to use a Dyson Big Ball. The main benefit being that using a Dyson vacuum or similar units with an integrated cyclone ensures that we have constant suction. Filter bag vacuums lose their suction the dirtier they get. Commercial air jet sieves have additional separate cyclone attachments that can be utilized to use a standard filter vacuum cleaner. A similar approach can be used there, but with more vacuums having built-in cyclones, it's unnecessary. The fitting I showed earlier snaps onto this vacuum tube directly. The sieves I'm using in this video are straight from China off of AliExpress. They're not ideal for air jet sieve applications as they have an inner brim, but this whole stack of sieves costs less than an individual sieve purchased from the North American vendors. Sufficient for testing and since they're a standard 200mm size, it is straightforward to make minor modifications to the unit to accommodate higher quality sieves later on. This upcoming modification is a result of an issue I had during testing. When I ran the air jet sieve with fine powder inside it, the fast moving small particles built up high static charge on the metal sieve frame. To dissipate the static charge, I need to connect the sieve frame to ground using a grounding cable. I used conductive copper tape that was placed on the wall of the main body where the sieve frame sits to make the connection to any sieve placed on top. To connect the conductive tape to the cable, I drill a small hole for a short M3 bolt to secure the cable to the tape. Once the screw is tightened, the other end of the cable can be plugged into the earth port in the wall. To check that the grounding is working, I use a multimeter to measure the resistance from the sieve frame to another earth port. I measured it to be around 3 ohms, very good connection. This completely resolved the static issue in subsequent testing. Newer commercial air jet sieves can accommodate various vacuum cleaner models by using a pressure sensor and throttling a valve on the suction port to achieve specific pressures from any vacuum cleaner. The alternative is to find the optimal pressure experimentally. This is done by testing the repeatability of the results at different suction settings. Suction settings are set by positioning the yellow bypass fitting. I start by measuring the total bypass height between the yellow and black fittings with the bypass in the fully open position. This results in the lowest suction in the system. I then calculate the required height to achieve different bypass percentages. Here's the sequence of steps I follow to test one of the bypass settings. Tear the scale with the sieve weight. Make sure to wear PPE for handling fine powders. Measure weight of testing samples. I use 20 gram samples. Place sieve on the air jet and secure the lid. Clean off any powder that already fell through on the scale. Keep it teared to the empty sieve weight. 
Turn on wand motor and activate vacuum. Let the sample run for 5 minutes. Video sped up here but you'll notice the sample is settling quickly on the edges due to a high bypass and low vacuum. Wipe material from the lid into the sieve and re-weigh it. Take note of the new weight. Rerun air jet sieve on the remaining sample to see if output weight remains the same. In theory, it's ideal to use the maximum allowable bypass, which is the least amount of vacuum required that will still give repeatable results. Too low of a pressure and particles aren't passing through effectively leading to poor repeatability. Too high of a pressure could force larger particles through the sieve resulting in inaccurate results. Repeat the process for other bypass settings, making sure to clean the sieve well between samples. Now having a pressure sensor, it's important to use a cyclone vacuum or having an inline cyclone unit to ensure that a certain bypass setting always produces the same suction. The calibration test results summarized in this table show that a 25% bypass had the highest repeatability. Now that we know the ideal bypass amount from the previous calibration, we can use the air jet sieve as intended. I tested a sample of the same powder on each of three different sieve sizes, following the same procedure as before to find out how much powder remains on each sieve. To clean the sieves, I made an adapter for these common soft hair brushes to attach it to the Dyson vacuum directly. These brushes are soft enough to use on the sieves without damaging them, and the vacuum makes it a mess-free job. In order to use the instrument, you have to at least know a rough estimate of the range your product will fall under to procure the correct sieves. These are the results from the test. There are many ways to format the output data depending on the standard you're following. In my case, I find it straightforward to use percentage retained and percentage passing. In this case, for example, I can calculate that about 9% of the sample is larger than 125 microns and 91% is smaller than 125 microns. While this model probably isn't going to be adopted by pharma labs anytime soon, I had enough of a need for it to design my own. I'm interested to see who else may have a similar need. The model has some mentioned shortcomings when compared to commercial models such as the lack of a pressure sensor and fine control over the wand RPM. These features may be overkill for your needs, not warranting the high cost of commercial models. My design gets me 99% of the functionality I require at a small fraction of the expense. I'm even considering building three more units so that I can run all four mesh sizes at the same time. This being a niche product, it doesn't really make sense to set up distribution for it. I've included a Google form in the description below for people who may be initially interested in the files to be informed when an assembly guide has been put together and the files are uploaded online for sale. I'll also keep the description updated regarding the status of the 3D files distribution. Thanks for watching.